right, well, good, nap good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're going to be talking today about the methods that journalists use to investigate organized crime and corruption. Um, you know, the ways in which money and power illicitly change hands are constantly evolving, as are the tools available to journalists to track that movement. We're joined by a distinguished group of journalists who have used a variety of methods from the old school to the cutting edge to explore wrongdoing and shine a light on the corrupt corridors of power. I'm going to briefly introduce you to our speakers, and then um, I'm going to get out of the way. We're going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers, so please be prepared to uh, ask these folks whatever you'd like. Um, we're joined today by Sheila Cornell. She's the director of the Sibyl Center for Investigative Journalism at Columbia University in New York City. She began a reporting career in the Philippines, reporting on topics including human, right, human rights abuses. She co-founded the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, and the center's work, among other things, helped lead to the ouster of a president. She's won many awards and written many books, including the excellently titled Coups, Cults, and Cannibals. I just wanted to name that book because I never get to say that otherwise. Um, then we're going to be joined by Shanique von Bertra. She's worked for uh, about two decades as an investigative reporter in Mexico for newspapers and magazines. She's investigated in cases involving drug trafficking, political corruption, health and social issues, and much more. She shares the 2013 Pulitzer Prize with the New York Times for an investigation into bribery by the Walmart Corporation in Mexico, and she'll tell you about that. We're also joined by Paul Radu. Paul is the executive director of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and the co-creator of the investigative dashboard, which you're all going to be introduced to in just a few minutes. Um, He's, a, he's also the co-founder of the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism. He's received numerous fellowships and won many awards. Um, this is a great group, and I'm really excited to have them with us. So, Sheila, if you'll start things off. Good afternoon, everyone. I, um, if my slides will show up, I'm going to talk about a very particular area of investigating corruption, and that is um, following the money, but particular kind of money and not just money. I'm looking at how you follow the wealth of kleptocrats all around the world. And I'm talking not just, not just money, but houses, cars, jets, and my favorite, shoes. So how did I get into this? Let's see if this works. Yes. So, you know, I come from the Philippines, and I grew up under a kleptocracy, the, that of Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. And there was very little that we knew about his wealth and his, how, how much he amassed all around the world, including Swiss bank accounts, real estate in Manhattan, and so on, until after they had left, when they left a trail of paper like this one. This was the first Swiss bank account that Marcus opened in 1968. And it, you can see there the real name is Ferdinand Marcos, but he uses a fake name to open this account. It's William Saunders. And this was among the documents found in the presidential palace after they had left. And this is another one. It's hard to read, but this is a letter from his minister of public works, whose task it was to collect bribes from Japanese companies. And you see in the letter here, I assure you, sir, meaning the president, that I will never open my mouth, even if it will cost me my life. So he was basically talking about the amounts of money that he was collecting and for which receipts were also issued and which receipts have also been found in the presidential palace. So what I want to say is that for the most part, we have found this wealth only after the regimes have been deposed from power. And as you see here, Gaddafi, those are estimates of the wealth they accumulated, Gaddafi, M Mubarak, etc., Ben Ali in Tunisia. We only found out about them after they had fallen. But I think now it's easier to do this even while kleptocrats, even while corrupt officials are in power. It's never, in a sense, it's never been easier. One, because there are financial disclosure laws. About 100 countries in the world now have freedom of information laws, which allow us to have easier access to records like com company records, real estate records, court records. We have financial disclosure laws that now make it mandatory for public officials to declare what they own and the amounts that they own. They may not always be telling the truth in these financial disclosures, but they give us a start. They give us a hint as to where we should begin. 
it's also now because of the internet and the, as Paul Radu will explain to you later, it's now easier to trace property and corporate records and court records worldwide without leaving where you are. So for example, a journalist in Jakarta can search for corporate records in Panama without leaving Jakarta. More, aside from that, there is now a growing community, an ecosystem of anti-corruption investigators and collaborators that journalists can work with. There are NGOs like Global Witness. There are private investigative companies hired by law firms or by banks that look into amassing of wealth, etc. There is there's also now a global legal infrastructure, the UN Anti-Corruption Convention, that makes it easier for journalists and NGOs to operate within you know, an existing global framework and allow them to do more investigations. So what does, if I were a kleptocrat, how would my portfolio look like? It is more or less to be able to hide the wealth and because you don't want the wealth exposed. This is wealth that has been illegally accumulated. I, as a kleptocrat, would prefer to put my assets and bank accounts in multiple jurisdictions. So I would put it in Switzerland, the Cayman Islands. I would give countless examples of this because it's, easy, it's harder to follow the trail and because the legal jurisdiction I will not put my money in my own country because then I become accountable to the laws in my own country. So I would spread them around. I would hide them very well in several layers of ownership and often in offshore havens which have lower degrees of transparency than, uh, than other places. So I would, I would hide them overseas but hide them very well. To give you an example, uh, no, this is, well, not yet an example. But this, is, this shows how much money is being um, sent overseas. As you can see, China, um, from 2000 and 2008, there's illegal money sent out in the amount of 2.8 trillion. The G GNP of China is 1.3 trillion dollars. So they, over the last, in this eight-year period, they've sent out more than twice their annual GDP. And it goes to countries like the United. So this is where the destinations of those money goes, U.S., Cayman Islands, U.K., Luxembourg, Germany, etc. So one thing that makes it easier for us is that all of these records are available. One thing that makes it harder is it's easier to hide them. But in fact, it's very hard to hide buildings. These are buildings acquired by Emel DeMarcus in New York. Very, this is one is Fifth Avenue, the other one in Wall Street. She tried her best to hide them, and indeed she was able to do that for a long time. And this is more or less typical of the way in which p corrupt politicians and organized crime hide their money. Remember, this was from the 1980s, so this is actually relatively fairly simple. But just to give you an idea, the company is owned on paper in the deed of the company. It's owned by this company in the Netherlands Antilles. That's one at the very top. This Netherlands Antilles company, in turn, is owned by three companies in Panama. And those Panamanian companies are, in turn, owned by another company in the Netherlands Antilles, which is, in turn, owned by another management company. So this is typical of the way wealth is hidden. It's layered. So these are four layers. Sometimes there's more than four layers. And it's in multiple countries around the world. It's not just in one country, making it difficult to find out and to hide. Um, I, I love following houses. Um, so this is one. I just want to show you some examples from my photo album of illegally acquired wealth that has been funneled into houses and been found out. So this is a $35 million compound in Malibu owned by the forestry minister of Equatorial Guinea. The forestry minister is also the son of the president of Equatorial Guinea. Just as you can see, it's a fabulous house. But the money for this house was paid for from oil revenues that companies like Exxon and other big oil companies paid to the Equatorian, Equatorian Guinean government, and that money was then used to buy property like this. Right? So it's hard to find how the bribery takes place. It's often easier to find out how the, bri the fruits of corruption are spent. So very often we reverse. It's, e it's 
easier to prove corruption not by looking at the actual acts of bribery, but how the money from bribery was spent. So we look at the asset trail. So more examples. Why do people do this? They do this because what use is money if you can't spend it? So what use is corruption if you cannot enjoy your wealth? Why steal if you cannot shop? So they leave kleptocrats leave a whole shopping trail that makes it easier for journalists and investigators to follow the money trail. So this is overseas, the kinds of overseas assets acquired by the Forestry Minister of Guinea and which was exposed both by Global Witness and Ken Silverstein of Harper's. So more, former Vice President of China owning this property overlooking Sydney Harbour, again traced by journalists because it's easier to trace the ownership of a house because there's public records available. This is a Hong Kong villa owned by the Zimbabwean president, Robert Mugabe. This is um, the case of a, of a former governor of Delta State in Nigeria who was found guilty of money laundering and put in prison in the UK recently. But again, the search for his assets started with looking at his house and cars. So they traced his, illicit, his secret bank accounts by tracing the purchases that he, that he made. And this is one of my favorites. Until recently, I thought it was only Imelda Marcos who had a passion for shoes. This is the president of Zambia, and part of the evidence that was presented in his court trial was a hundred pairs of specially made for him with his initials, genuine leather shoes made in an artisanal shop in, in, I think, Switzerland. But this, the shoes, the schooling of his children, um, real estate overseas were all paid for from bank accounts in Belgium and Switzerland that had been set up actually um, to, pay, um, to funnel secret intelligence funds. So he used intelligence funds money, um, siphon it through banks around the world and use it to buy um, things like this. And, and part of the evidence in the trial came out from a libel case, a libel suit that he had filed against a journalist and the journalist's lawyer then used discovery procedures in court to be able to get access to bank accounts. So it, the list goes on and on. Sorry. Um, I, I cannot, I, mean, I will not have much time, but this is Tony Ngeni, um, the chief whip of the ANC, who was um, put in prison for receiving a Mercedes-Benz SUV in South Africa as, um, as a bribe from a European company that had won the bid to supply the South African Navy with um, equipment. So how do we follow the asset trail? We, first of all, we follow the family, because usually it's the spending of the family that, um, that, that is most obvious, the son of the president, the wife of the president, the mistress of the president. So we usually draw a family tree. Usually also assets are put in the name of family members. We also track, you know, the social networks because sometimes the fronts for many of these asset acquisitions are either old trusted friends, classmates from grade school, members of the same social club, the same fraternity, the same social group. And lastly, we look for the intermediaries that make these purchases, these acquisitions possible. So they are lawyers, accountants, bankers. So in the case, of um, the forestry minister of Equatorial Guinea, um, Theodorin Obiang, the, the person who was listed as having purchased that mansion in Malibu was actually an account officer in a bank in the U.S. who came out as like the property manager for the property and even travel agents. So the famous case that of, um, of uh, BAE bribing Saudi royalty a lot of the initial information from, came from travel agents who booked holidays and hotels and shopping trips in Harrods for members of the Saudi royal family. So this is in China, even in a system as opaque as China. Uh, this is from an investigation of the New York Times. It's possible to get the shareholdings of members, in this case, of the prime minister's family. So this is the one. It's always tempting, so this is an expose by the New York Times, the billions hidden, um, of hidden wealth, a 
actually not that well hidden, as it turned out, of um, the Prime Minister and his family. So family is always the pla first place to look at, because in the end, who else can a kleptocrat trust? Not his associates, not his people in his political party, not even his friends, but at most he can trust the most his wife and his children. And it's often in family members where assets are hidden. And this is true globally. If there's one thing that unites kleptocrats is the propensity to put assets in the names of their family. This is also from China, the recent, um, you know, the well-publicized case of Bo Silai, who was recently sentenced in China, and his wife who was sentenced for the murder of a British businessman. They, too, hid the wealth, as you see in the names of her brother and sister and his brothers and sisters. Again, the family trail. Um, this is another example. This is much more complicated. I wish I had more time. This is a Russian um, um, deputy minister of Russia, very close to Vladimir Putin, and he also had uh, money. It was actually a bribe in the guise of a loan, supposedly, that his company made to another Russian company, and the loan made something like 40% interest a year. So he made millions in just a short span of time through a series of companies, shell companies, and again, one of the shell companies, this is a certificate in a, I think this is a, uh, either a Cayman Islands company or some offshore company in the name of his wife. So again, family. Um, the problem is that many, as Paul will probably tell you, many, the information collected on companies around the world is very, very minimal. So even in the U.S., which is supposed to be transparent, it's very hard to get the shareholders of a private company. So that is a real challenge for investigators. But we can often see that it is a shell company, that, com that something is being hidden here. So, so these are sort of the red flags for spotting front companies. One is if there's excessive layering, as we saw in the case of that building on Fifth Avenue that was bought by Imelda Marcos, there was no need to be so secretive in the ownership, but since there were like four or five layers of ownership, it's a sign that something probably is being hidden there. So the use of multiple jurisdictions, usually offshore, means also it's a sign that some something nefarious is happening, sometimes the same addresses or non-existent addresses. So these are all like what you should be looking out for if you, if you, if you think that money is being kept in the name of a, of a shell company. I try to go very fast. So this is the new ways of bribing um, expensive artwork. So we know about houses, money, but sometimes the bribe takes form of artwork. Sometimes now it's no longer cash, but shares of stock in a company or a tip to say, you know, you should buy this stock because the price is going to rise. These are all based on actual cases of corruption around the world. Another way to bribe is to hire my a kleptocrat spouse or mistress as a consultant or director. Another way happens all around the world, have a government entity take out a non-existent loan, a fake loan, and the loan payments would be made to the kleptocrat or to the corrupt official. Another way is overpriced government contract with the price difference going to the bank account of a corrupt official. This is very common. Usually companies that bribe do not just give cash, but they pay for the boarding school, summer vacation, Ivy League, college tuition. They pay for shopping. They pay for the wedding and honeymoon. Of. And this, this is like... So many cases of this, is companies shoulder the expenses, the lifestyle of officials, instead of giving them cash, loan that isn't paid, a donation to a foundation or charity, buying a house or an asset at a far more expensive price, and monthly retainers. So these are the various ways in which bribes have been given to officials. And I'd like to end with this from an oil company executive. You used to give a dictator a suitcase of dollars. Now you give a tip on your stock shares or buy a housing estate from his uncle or mother at 10 times its worth. So, there. Thank you.
Well, um, I'm going to talk to you about the Walmart case. This is a, um, a story that we did with just hardcore reporting, hardly any. I think the most sophisticated tool we used was an Excel sheet and uh, Word. But this was um, pretty much just uh, a lot of FOIA requests and reporting. This story began, well, David Barso and I, I'm a freelancer in Mexico, a Mexican reporter, and David is a staff uh, investigative reporter in the New York Times. David um, well, tells the story that he received uh, a tip fell on top of his, of his desk as, as, and it was the way the tip arrived in his desk was just um, very uh, totally, he cannot explain why it was him who received it. it was, he says it's just like a, a uh, Boeing was flying over the New York Times building and, and, and happened to drop an envelope at the time passing on top of his area. Um, what he got was a series of documents from, appear to be in, uh, Walmart um, inner documents that told uh, the following story. A man called Sergio Cicero, who used to be um, the man in charge of making Walmart grow in Mexico, had, um, come, uh, had uh, sent an mail in, back in 2005 to Walmart's main lawyer and had um, told her that well, he, what his responsibility had been for many years, he was never, uh, no, um, no longer at Walmart, but he had helped Walmart grow. And, the, and what he uh, explained in these mails is that he had put together a scheme uh, where we had an alternative structure of something like middlemen that were outsiders of Walmart who were in, char were in charge of sort of, few, of making things work. Uh, that is, paying bribes to get no's, uh, yes, when a no should be in place or to uh, fasten the times for permits in different bureaucracies across the country. This investigation, this um, tip um, triggered an, an in internal investigation and, and David caught like a glimpse of what this how far this investigation had, had gone in inside Walmart. What he did for the next uh, month, I, was, I wasn't in the picture yet, but he basically had to corroborate, uh, it, this seems like a great uh, tip. Um, Walmart had just uh, in, around 2000, uh, in the start of the 2000s, he had, they had just started um, their expansion outside of the U.S. and Mexico was their first excursion abroad. And in the, exactly the years where this man described as being the ones where he was sort of in charge of growth, were the years that uh, Walmart had a, a very spectacular growth in Mexico. They basically took hold of every, every town, every city that had um, uh, an idle place of, uh, piece of, of, of land. Um, and it came to a point that Walmart had become the, when, when we started the story, Walmart Mexico had become the, the largest subsidiary, the one that um, after the U.S. it was the second one in terms of profit. Um, so what he did is basically we had to, he had to corroborate if this Sergio Cicero man existed and, and if he was trustworthy. And he had to, uh, he found a way, I cannot tell you the details, but he had found a way to uh, have someone collaborate and this someone left um, a USB with thousands of records in a nice machine in a hotel. And that's what really triggered the investigation, the access to inside documents of Walmart that helped him at the very beginning understand what this tip had triggered within the company. What was interesting is because, uh, for the New York Times at the, uh, then is the U.S. Uh, well, this is something very odd for a Mexican, but U.S. law um, oblige American companies to confess whenever they know they have or they suspect they ha may have committed a crime abroad. So as soon the the U.S. The Walmart should have told the U.S. Department that they had reasons to believe uh, corruption had been uh, committed in Mexico. And apparently from what uh, David uh, uh, was able to, to find out, this, this didn't happen. Instead of that, Walmart had decided to stop the investigation and, and forget, it, uh, forget about it, um, absolutely. So um, with this, Dave, what, this um, David uh, spent a long time reviewing so the inner workings of Walmart trying to understand how, what, what is normal inside of Walmart, how do companies, you, how, how does this company usually manage corruption um, or, or when vo someone voices uh, concerns about corruption and what is the process. So he investigated the investigators. 
And it came to a point when he decided that we needed someone in the ground in Mexico to corroborate what this man uh, had said. What David uh, um, learned by the, from the inner documents is that Walmart, in fact, had stopped the investigation at some point. Their researchers, who are ex-FBI, ex-CIA guys, you know, police, uh, tough, who know how to do police, police work, had found hundreds of, re hundreds of payments that seemed suspicious. And um, they, did cor they did learn that there was such a structure of middlemen and that there were payments funneled to these middlemen. But that's, that is as far as they went. So basically what David decided is to just con continue the investigation they dropped and on the other side learn why it was that they had decided to set it aside. And that's where I came in. And um, what we did in the following time was, well, these are the... I'm just, these are two stories. I, I didn't have to, I didn't take it. Okay. Thank you. So what we decided then is, um, Sergio Cicero, this, um, this man had told Walmart about a series, a collection of stores, where he said, like, with a lot of detail, uh, a bribes had been paid. What we did is we started a, a, a very intensive FOIA um, uh, request process the FOIA has been in Mexico for around 10, 13 years. It's in all municipalities, states, and, and the federal government. And um, it's still something, it's, it's a tool reporters are learning to, how to use, and also bureaucrats are learning how to, how to attend to that. What we did is we, we made a, um, a very intense use of FOIA, just first in the beginning to just prove these set of cases that CICERO had said. And as, as, as as David went on discovering things in, these, in this uh, database of documents, we, we found more and more hints of more payments, possibly funnels for an, other stores. So we ended up investigating uh, more than 20, I mean, um, we actually pinned down more than 20 stores all over the country. Um, and what we did is collect every permit, looked in every agency possible for whatever permit um, they had asked for. How do you prove corruption? That was our first, uh, you've said it, it's easier to, to find the results of corruption, but how do you prove corruption occurred? And what we did is this, we decided on, a, on a, this following strategy. Um, we, just, we decided to study what was normal, because corruption, pay, what it pays is exceptions. So if we, we thought if we, we were able to, to, to um, recognize normal procedures, how it worked for others, then we would be able to, to determine if there were exceptions and anomalies in the files we were reading for Walmart. And that's more or less the same thing David did in the, in the Walmart inner investigation. He op made it a broader um, search into how does Walmart investigate itself usually and how did, how did they work on this specific case. Um, so um, what we learned from asking uh, all these, making these, we made uh, around 800 FOIAs nationwide, and what resulted was um, that we found that ev almost everywhere when there was a, well, there was a problem, the problem miraculously disappeared. You could have either, for example, an organization of market vendors who were opposing the construction of Walmart, and one day afterwards, Suddenly, like by art of magic, the, the, the hurdle had been removed. And we started matching information that David found in this uh, mining uh, work in the, in the in, in, in Walmart documents. We found uh, payment, possible payment records, and we started sort of um, crossing what I was finding in the ground in terms of the dates permits were given versus the dates payments apparently had been given. Um, so we ended up having patterns, and these patterns made us um, feel much more confident that this man was speaking the truth. Also, we investigate this man because Walmart alleged that, uh, uh, argumented that this man had robbed the money or his or his, this this middle, middleman. Um, we were able to see that. So we also looked into their um, homes and properties, their assets, and we didn't find anything that would point at um, that would indicate that they had made more money or um, diverting Walmart's money. Um, 
We also looked into some, some of the, um, there was a couple of cases that Sergio Cicero talked more about. One was a, 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 the case of a story. This used to be a Ford, a Ford factory, the big, the massive construction there. And um, he was pretty fun because they had built a whole SAM store without a single permit. It took us a year of looking around all local government to determine, yes, there was not a single permit. But it took us only a Google image to learn that, in fact, that they had, um, they had, they told the authority that they had, um, um, uh, they had only remodeled the building. And what we were able to see is that they had actually just expanded by one third the building, avoiding a lot of permits that are very crucial within a city, like traffic impact studies. They would have probably had been forced to invest in roads and uh, whatever. So, this is, so we looked into some of the specific stories that he was mentioning and, um, and what we did is that we, so we, sorry. So um, what, what, what resulted is, well, this, was this, this one tool I, I used was just this Excel file to keep track of our FOIAs. And we used the chronology. Each store became a chronology. All what we found in these documents became a chronology. And Mexico, as many other Latin American countries, is a, a, doc, a government made, of, made in paper. Every, there's a copy of things everywhere. And there's stamps and, and sign, like five different stamps and signatures in each document. And this, at the beginning, they became a little bit um, heavy. Some of them were pretty uh, hundreds of pages long. Uh, down the road, they became more and more. We started cleaning them and find, really learning what was, what was important, what of all was important. So the chronology was a way, the tool that allowed us to, to notice what was, what was what, what, that made things stood out, stand out. We also, since we worked in, uh, in two countries, uh, well, we had a road map. It was just a, a document that went back and forth with, like, where we strategized what we, were, um, what we were putting more attention to. And this was the big, the other big key. It's just a lot of patience and help for your finger to, um, to look over thousands and thousands of records. Um, there was one thing, well, this doesn't look well. It says thoughtfulness. Um, at some point, I, I had never seen anybody, any other reporter, think as much as I saw David think. And, um, well, you can actually see how he thinks because it goes like that. So what I learned from, also from this reporting is how much thought you have to put into reporting, like every stage of the, and, and every stage of the reporting process. And that was like the mantra of all the investigation. We decided, I don't know, my time is okay? Or, um, there was um, at some, well, one of the, so the first, uh, we did determine at the very beginning that we had to be very, very cautious with the story. We had to be absolutely silent. And uh, for our, um, the Mexican transparency law, in fact, helped us because you don't have to say who you are to ask for information. So for many, many months, even a year, I was seen, for example, I would go to a public office and spend two or three days of every week looking at, after records, and not one person ever asked me who I was or why I was there. So even the transparency laws helped us in, in having, just protecting the documents we were looking at and protecting the secrecy of the investigation at some point. Um, um, we ended publishing one first story about Walmart covering up, deciding to cover up the, the, the bribe scheme. It, they, um, and at some point in the story, we ran into a person. So we were, sorry, all, all the time we were absolutely silent. Hardly anybody other than like our spouses knew of the investigation and the editors. And at one point I decided to open my heart to a friend who I thought it was very, had a very good, um, could, could give me good insights. And after I confided in him of what the story was about, he said, he just shrugged his elbows, his, his shoulders and said, and, and why, why would that be important? We all do it. Yeah. And 
That's why I think we found like the, the drive to make the second story. Why does it matter? Because when we when we um, because in Mexico the, the assumption is Mexico is corrupt, so everybody does it. And the reason it matters is because, for example, we found this story that the Wakan you might you might have read about in 2004 because it, it's a story that went um, across the world. But there was this is a a very important site in Mexico where we have very antique pyramids, and it's like the heart of the Mexican soul. And Walmart set a store uh, not far from, the, well, like a mile and a half from the pyramids. But there was a group of four old men, uh, or old people, this woman uh, on the right, and three old men with diabetes, who started, who, who sensed there was something wrong. Walmart hadn't, things had, hadn't gone for Walmart as they did for every other citizen in the town. They had completed permises in, uh, in, in, in record times. They had avoided inspection from archaeologists who were digging and, and just taking care that uh, no other pyramid gets, um, um, no, that the Walmart wouldn't be built on top of the pyramid. That they basically things were started in a way that are not the common thing for people in Teotihuacan. And um, this is Emanuel, another man who was part of that group. This story tore a whole community up. The four, these, these four old people, three of them are dead after they, had, they made a 30-day hunger strike and their, their, their health was very, well, they decayed a lot and the, they died. And this other man, um, in 2009, um, he just lost it. He went to his home, he got a can, he, he opened some firecrackers and poured the the powder in the, fire, in, the, in the can, put some uh, nails in the can, put it in his pocket, and drove to the Walmart. And made that, um, he took a cart uh, and, and went into the Walmart and made it explode. Um, he, this, a nail penetrated like a cabbage bag of a woman. No one else was hurt but himself. But this man died in prison uh, one year later. Uh, and he kept writing letters um, in regards to the Walmart of uh, Teotihuacan until his death. So um, we'd, th these people had sense all the way that there was something wrong. But funny, even though the, all the attention from the community, from the international and national media were there, nobody had made the job to sort of translate what they were saying and try and understand what was, what was going on at the time. Um, and uh, so there was a reason for the story. There was a, um, the drive for the story was that people there had a hunch and they only didn't have the abilities to investigate it or to, to unearth it. And we had something they didn't. We had Sergio Cicero who said, we paid four different brides to, to, to build that store. Um, uh, so, one, one thing, well, I won't be, we had, we, there was, I won't go back into details. We had, we spent, we had to spend like a year looking for a, 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 a traces of a map that had been um, key to, to one of the, to establish the store there. I think what was very important here was the, the, experience, the idea of, of two, two reporters from two countries came, coming together was really enriching. David Barstow had a great experience using FOIA. I understood bureaucracy, um, but I think the, the, um, that empowered, that made our FOIA request much more powerful, much more creative. Um, um, yes, <laughs> um, I think that's it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I work with an organization called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, and uh, together with my colleagues, we investigate uh, crime and corruption in Eastern Europe, uh, but also in, in other. Oh. Okay, so I'll, I'll just hold it. 
So, uh, with my colleagues, we investigate crime and corruption in Eastern Europe and also beyond Eastern Europe. Uh, we worked uh, quite a bit in Mexico, uh, you know, in uh, Northern uh, uh, South America and so on. And what we do is we track uh, the money, mostly the money and the companies of criminals, of, uh, of crooks. Um, and I believe, you know, Investigative reporting in this area, in the uh, in investigations into organized crime and corruption, are very important because nobody else at this point in time in the world is able to do them uh, efficiently but journalists. I mean, if, if we look at the, the uh, law enforcement agencies, we hear a lot, you know, about the, you know, uh, NSA spying all of us, you know, or the FBI or the DEA having a long arm and grabbing people from there and there and there for drug trafficking and all that. But the truth of the matter is these agencies are very inefficient. And that is for, uh, for one simple reason. Uh, organized crime operates across borders. Uh, you know, left, right, uh, Muslim, Christian, whoever, they cooperate and they cooperate very well. Um, they sell uh, goods to each other, they sell criminal skins to, uh, to, to each other, you know, and they operate across many, many frontiers. Now, law enforcement is not operating uh, across many frontiers, be it very powerful law enforcement. Just think about your local law enforcement in your country, in your, in your city. Um, you'll find out that uh, they're interested in serving you as their citizens first, you know. So uh, what's going on is whenever you want to investigate, whenever law enforcement wants to investigate a criminal group that operates uh, across many frontiers, there's going to be these requests between law enforcement, for instance, from my country, you know, in Romania, and the law enforcement in the United Kingdom or in Chile or in Brazil. But uh, this cooperation for law enforcement is not a priority because law enforcement is paid by local money. Law enforcement is national. So in that case, uh, what's going on is uh, most of these cases, most of the cross-border cases, are put aside and they rest there for a long, long time until they're touched. Guess what? Criminals move much faster than that. They make a deal and run. So, you know, we have all these uh, channels of uh, communication between law enforcement like Interpol or Europol or, you know, all sorts of, uh, of other ways to uh, cooperate. Those are very slow. All of them. You have to create rogatory commissions between countries uh, to be able to, you know, send prosecutors from country A to country B to investigate this criminal group. Now, criminals move much faster than that. And this is what we do too. We can move as fast as criminals or almost as fast as criminals. Now, our problem is that we don't have the resources that criminals have. Criminals have lots of money, sometimes billions, lots of other types of resources from technology to, I don't know, uh, friends in the, uh, high places in government, uh, you know, in many countries and so on. So they're uh, beneficiaries of uh, corruption, they're beneficiaries of this lack of cooperation between countries, and they uh, many times can work with impunity uh, in many, many countries at the same time. But this is also their weak point. The fact that they operate across many frontiers gives us the possibility to investigate them in many, many points. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from Eastern Europe, and um, lots of the journalists in Eastern Europe are very frustrated, and they're, uh, uh, you know, exposing all these criminal groups operating, you know, inside the country, and no nothing happens. And nothing happens for various reasons, you know. Maybe the law enforcement is corrupt in that country. Maybe the politicians have an interest in that organized crime group or, you know, there are many, many other reasons. But when you manage to expose a group that operates not just inside that country, but in other countries, then you can hurt them in places where uh, they don't expect to be hurt. hurt. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, we were uh, exposing this criminal network uh, that we dubbed the proxy platform. It's a network that allowed uh, uh, lots of, crime, uh, lots of uh, crime groups, from the Vietnamese uh, criminal groups to Russian uh, uh, organized crime to the Mexican Sinaloa cartel to launder money via offshore companies based in many uh, countries in the world. Now, we uh, reported on this platform. We exposed all this and nothing happened in Russia, nothing happened in Latvia, nothing happened in the Republic of Moldova, nothing happened in many countries. But something happened in New Zealand 
And why, uh, why that was important was because hundreds of the companies that they were using to set up this platform for money laundering, to launder crime proceeds, uh, so hundreds of these companies were actually registered in New Zealand. And the government of New Zealand decided to shut those companies down. So this is a way to hurt uh, criminal business by operating across borders, by cooperating with colleagues in, in, in many countries. So this is also their, their weak, weak spot. Um, I'd, I'd also say that uh, times work in our favor when we're investigating organized crime. Lots of these groups are set up years and years ago, and they, uh, they were set up in a different world. They were set up in a world where there weren't these many databases that we can use in order to track down the money, to track down the assets, to track down, you know, property and all that. Uh, but times changed. There's more and more information, and this is in our favor. Now, of course, at the same time, there's a balance there because crime groups became more and more sophisticated as well. Uh, but if we're able to, to use uh, in an efficient way these databases, we can actually find out, you know, what, what, what their connections are, and we can follow the money uh, across borders. Now, uh, what we're doing at the uh, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project is we're investigating the interface between the crime world and uh, our world. Criminals, as Sheila pointed out, need to buy goods, need to, to, uh, to work with people who are not criminals sometimes. Sometimes they work with... Uh, uh, people that facilitate their crimes as well, with lawyers, with accountants, and so on and so on. But uh, the best point to investigate the criminal yeah, world is yeah, the interface yeah. between our world, right now here, and their world. You know, there's, there's always a, a, a connection there. Um, when, I, when I started working on this, it was in, uh, you know, in uh, investigating organized crime, it was in uh, 99. Uh, at that point, you know, I had very limited knowledge of what's going on. Um, and uh, it happened that I met this uh, great journalist who sits right here in the front row, uh, Alain Lalmont. Uh, I met him in Maastricht. He was giving a talk about organized crime, uh, crime in Eastern Europe, uh, Russian orga uh, organized crime and others. And I was fascinated by that. You know, he was telling us about uh, big time money laundering, about connections that went up in politics and, uh, and, and all that. You know, and that was my, my starting point. After meeting Alain, I started investigating this. And, you know, Alain, in those times, I think he had a really, really hard, hard, uh, hard job because information was scarce. In 99, I mean, compared to the information that is available now, the information was very, very little. Uh, but what's, what's also true is, uh, you know, we're operating across many, many frontiers. And we noticed that, uh, uh, you know, media and journalism in many countries uh, is very poor. It's very poor from many points of view. Of course, money is lacking, you know. If you go, you know, uh, we uh, worked quite a bit uh, in the past few years in Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, journalists need to have two or three jobs. Sometimes they own very small plots, uh, uh, plot, you know, where they look for diamonds. Sometimes they work, uh, they access PR for uh, some uh, political party or the government. And at the same time, they're journalists, and they want to do a good job. They want, they want to, do, to do a good job, but it's uh, virtually impossible for them. And what they lack most is access to information, and especially to cross-border information. This is why we built this tool, what, we, what you see projected right here. Uh, it's called the Investigative Dashboard. And this is, you know, you heard uh, from, from she Sheila and from Franik, uh, you, you heard about following the money, about uh, finding the company record, about finding who's behind an offshore company. Now, this is what we're trying to do with the Investigative Dashboard. Um, so this is, this is a website uh, that you access and where you can find data on companies. Uh, we have some data that we indexed ourselves with the help of, uh, uh, of our friend, uh, Dan Wiggin, who is also here in, in the audience. He's a hacker, a hacktivist. We are working with hackers. This helps us a lot. And I'm talking about civic hackers. I'm talking about the good guys, not the guys that uh, steal money from your bank accounts. Um, so we, we have a side of the investigative dashboard where you have data index, where you can search for companies or persons. There's another side, uh, side of it where, that points you out to the national register of companies where you can actually track down the money. And the third, and I think the most useful uh, part of it, is actually the research desk that is run by Miranda Patrucic, who's going to run a, a workshop tomorrow at 4. Uh, you'll have some details on these uh, pieces of paper here. 
about all this. Um, and this is where you can get assistance in tracking down the assets and the money of, uh, you know, corrupt politicians or criminals or uh, whatever. Uh, why, why is su such a tool and other tools, other similar tools, very, very important? Because I, I think times, times are changing quite a bit. I mean, it used to be, you know, that the journalist would be the lightning rod, you know. Uh, I, I, I'd sit here and I'd have, I, I'd have information coming my way, I would filter that information and I would put that information out in the open, you know. And that would be my big scoop, my big... But, but the truth is that no matter how good I am, no, no matter how good you are, you know, there's a lot more corruption that we cannot uncover, that we cannot expose. So what we need to do is to build tools like this to help others who are not investigative reporters to try to investigate organized crime and, and corruption. And not, not only this, um, what we're doing a lot, using the investigative dashboard, using all sorts of uh, tech tools, is uh, we are fishing for information. I'll give you one, uh, one, one example. Um, what you see here right now is an image uh, from, the, from the airport in Bucharest, the capital of Romania. So I was there waiting for a friend of mine to come from Chisinau, from the Republic of Moldova. There are small planes that come from Chisinau to Bucharest. It's, it's a very short distance. My friend rushed up uh, on, on the gates of this airport, you know, and he was saying, Paul, Paul, you would not believe this. You would not believe what I saw in the plane. I said, what did you see? And he said, in the business class, in those, this small plane, there were three persons. All of them mobsters, convicted, convicted for crimes. Uh, one of them, uh, you see the guy on the left-hand side, he stole 60 million uh, euros from a bank. The other one was involved in financial scams, and there, there's a third one that is uh, not here, who was convicted also for bank fraud and for laundering money for uh, criminal groups, including Russian criminal groups. Now, this was the first time we saw these guys together. Nobody knew that they were connected in any way. And we were lucky to be there. I took my phone out, you know, and I filmed this, you know. I, I wanted to have a shot of these guys together. Then we, we thought about this. Okay, so what were these three guys doing in the Republic of Moldova? And we went to the Registry of Companies in Moldova. We did just a simple search on their names, and we found out that they were involved in, uh, in companies But, okay, so in, in a bunch of companies, together with the wife of the head of the Moldovan Secret Service, and they were trying to start some business there. Now, uh, let me ask you this. This was pure luck that we were there. So, in my opinion, this is not good reporting. We should have done better than this. And this is what we're uh, actually doing right now at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. We are fishing... Uh, in databases. What we do is we take the names of all the members of the parliament in our countries, we take the names of all our mobsters, and we run them through databases to find their commercial interests. And this is important for uh, one particular reason. Um, and that is, you know, I mean, as journalists, we're uh, used to reporting after the facts, after the crime happened, you know, and we're reporting, okay, these guys did it, you know, and, and that's good, we're exposing them. But in my opinion, it's much more important to try to prevent crime, the crime from happening. I, but I tell you what happened in this case. We exposed these guys. We exposed all, all their network. You see here an infographics with their connections. Uh, what, the, what they were trying to do in the Republic of Moldova was to uh, put on TV this Euro bingo game that they uh, uh, used three times in Romania to scam people. So they just moved from Romania to Moldova to apply the same uh, criminal scheme. We exposed all this before they started it. We saw that they were associated, we, we, we saw that they were looking for a license to broadcast this game and to, uh, to steal uh, money from people. And we exposed this in the Moldovan media, in the Romanian media, and they couldn't do business as usual. Of course, we called them as well, and they were very angry at us, you know, and they, they said that we are worse than the police, you know, and that we are ruining their lives, and, all this, and we were happy for this. So what I'm, what I'm talking about here is that we can be pre-crime. We can prevent crime from happening in a much more efficient way than the law enforcement can. 
and just by exposing things in a public way, uh, and of course, we didn't say, you know, that these guys are going to do crime in Moldova because crime has not happened yet. But what we presented was, you know, what they've done previously in Romania and also their association with the wife of the head of the Secret Service and also with another general from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, which was illegal for that guy. So imagine a world where, you know, you're investigating an organized crime group in your part of the world, you know, in your country, and then you actually watch where that criminal uh, group is moving. You know, what, what, we see, uh, what we saw quite a bit in Eastern Europe was we would expose a group and then that group would move to somewhere in Africa, in West Africa or in uh, Central Africa, you know. I think it's our duty to work with our colleagues there and to expose the group before doing damage in those parts of the world as well. So it all comes down to cooperating, collaborating across borders and trying to do something useful. But for doing this, it's not enough, you know, that journalists cooperate. We need to cooperate with activists. We need to cooperate with uh, uh, hackers. We need to, to cooperate with just anybody who can help us. We will still get the glamorous story, the nice story, you know, because we are the storytellers. But if we can also prevent something from happening, I think then we're fulfilling a double purpose, you know. Uh, thank you.